the essence of Christian work according to the Apostle Paul was nothing less than working alongside others to help them attain greater joy, greater happiness in the Lord mm-hmm. in their life. That's it. Whether you're a pastor, a teacher, an evangelist, a musician, whatever, whatever we are, a, a child, an adult, an old person, whatever, that is our work as a Christian is to bring joy into someone's life. Joy in the Lord. And uh, we started this a couple of weeks ago. I want to continue it because I I, I believe this subject, it it, it deserves more time. I do. I I don't think we've got hold of what joy in the Lord is yet. Because we're so caught up with what joy in the world is, it's difficult to separate the two and get a grasp on what joy in the Lord is, because it's so, so different. It's so different. But our job, our mission, our mandate while we're on this earth is to bring joy to others. And I can prove that by Paul's scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 24, where he said, Not that I lord it over your faith, but I am a worker with you for your joy. I love that, Dex. I am a worker with you for your joy. That's our mandate, every one of us. And uh, what he's saying here, I looked it up in the literal translation of the Greek, it's it's like this, not that I am your master and you are my servants. This is what Paul's saying to the Corinth church. But I am a fellow worker with you for your joy. That's our job. Every human being is searching for happiness. Every human being is searching for joy. And Paul is is no different than any other human being. He's found the search. And he knows what the search is. It's the treasure. And that treasure is Jesus Christ. And that's where that joy is. And he takes us into that. So we're going to continue in the search a little deeper today. What is Christian joy? And compare it, I guess, to what is joy outside of Christ. Your joy, your happiness in the Lord is of utmost importance to God. Utmost importance. Please understand that. It's it's God's utmost that you are joyful. It's that important to Him. And it should be my utmost also. That I'm happy. That I'm joyful. I'm not going to find it outside of him. And uh, why should it be my utmost? Because God is most glorified when you are most satisfied in him. (laughs) God is most glorified when you are most satisfied in him. God is seen more in your life, more in my life, when I am happy in him. Does it mean we can't be sad? No, it doesn't. Does it mean we can't be sorrowful? No, it doesn't. But people need to see, even in times of sorrow, even in times of sadness and hardship and temptations and trials, that we still have a joy that anchors us. Mm -hmm. And it's the Lord. (coughs) That doesn't mean that I can add anything to God's glory, because I can't. But rather, His glory can add everything to me. (laughs) And uh, God doesn't need anything. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. But he's allowed us this great privilege of being a vessel to carry his glory. No, that awesome? And uh, Acts 17, verse 24, 25, The God who made the world and everything in it, being the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples or bodies made by man, um, uh, temples, buildings, I'm sorry, made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needs anything since he himself gives to all mankind life, breath and everything. God doesn't need anything from anyone. Zero. He doesn't need your worship. Shock, horror. If I went into most churches and said that, they'll throw me out. God does not need your praise. He does not need your worship. The reason God commands us to worship Him is not because He is needy. 
It's because he's not because he's some kind of narcissist being that demands you to sing because he's so great. That is not the God we serve. Although for some of us it may have been the way we were taught it when we were younger. Um, when we're needy, we want people to meet our needs. Huh? And by doing good things for us or saying nice words. Um, but not God. He doesn't care whether you say nice words or not to him. It doesn't faze him at all. You can call him anything. It doesn't faze him. He's too big for that. And that's where he wants us to come in this place of joy, that we become big enough that we can take the knocks, the trials, the temptations, the persecution, the sufferings, the pains, mm -hmm. and still count it all joy. <laughs> Why? Because outside of that, there's something ahead of us that's far greater than those problems. So why does God make statements like, praise me all you people in the Psalms? Well, the Psalms are full of it. God's asking, praise me, you people. The problem is the way we've interpreted it. We've made it sound like God's needy and, and he wants us to praise him. God's not needy. He doesn't need your praise. Um, is God looking for admiration? Like we centrally look for it. No, of course not. Um, the Irish scholar and author, C.S. Lewis, he, he said it like this. He, he babbled over why God wants us to worship him. Why do you want me to worship you, God, was his question. And he concluded this in his approach. He said, we are happy to praise what we enjoy. Mm -hmm. huh? Because the praise not merely expresses our joy, but completes the enjoyment. And uh, I'll take that a little bit further. My praise expresses my delight or my happiness in God, which completes my joy. Now, the problem is in the church, we're looking to become joyful in our praise. It will never work. It's temporary. So that sentence should change the way you think about God. Praise completes my enjoyment. Or my happiness in God. Praise will not bring you sustained joy. Unless you're willing to sing 24 hours a day. <laughs> you know when you go into a, a large gathering. And you praise God. And you sing. And you lift your hands. And, and you worship Him. There's an awesome feeling that comes with that. I mean just listening to Dexter. It like brings tears to your eyes. Just entering into that praise. But as soon as it's stopped, that emotion will subside. And by the time you walk out the door, it will have left you. So praise will not bring sustained joy. Praise is the byproduct of the joy that I already have. In other words, I'm already joyful in the Lord. That's why I praise Him. I don't praise him to get joyful. And that's the problem we're seeing in the modern church in the last two or three centuries, where the people will come in, the musicians will play, they'll play three or four fast songs and then three or four quieter songs. And, and to start with, they'll whip them into this euphoria to lift that emotion. Why? Because they're carrying baggage, we all do. And then drop it down a tempo into solemn. But that emotion will not sustain that person. It's a lovely feeling. It's a great feeling. It's like going to a concert. It's wonderful. No, you've been to a concert. Not even a Christian. There's this euphoria that goes with it. But you cannot sustain your life off that. That's why that euphoria that comes from a session of worship and praise in the church gathering can leave soon after you leave the building and music and singing has its way of drawing man's emotions. Man, I can sit there and listen to Dex and cry buckets of tears. <laughs> I don't know about you, I can't. I mean, he's just got the touch. God's anointed him to do that. Um, it can draw your emotion toward God, but that emotion won't be sustained by that music. David was summoned by Saul. Here's a good example. Because Saul was 
letting off. And so summons David, play me music, sing, worship to me, uh, to God and praise. And, and that's what David, that's how he became king eventually. That's how he got in the door. By doing that. And it soothed, the Bible says that it soothed or calmed the troubled mind of Saul. So that's the effect that music can have on us. Mm -hmm. Which means we need to ask this question honestly of ourselves. Do I worship God because of the joy I have in Him, or do I worship God to experience joy? In other words, I'm on a downer, I come to church, we have some upbeat songs, now I'm feeling better. That's a tough question, isn't it? Do I worship God because of the joy I already have? And that's a byproduct of that. Or do I worship God to find that joy? Because you never will. It will only come as an experience and leave as an experience. Example, you've just finished an awesome T-bone steak. Huh? And it tasted so good and you express your appreciation for it. That's what praise is. The waitress comes along. How was the steak? So it was awesome. Loved it. That's praise. It complements your satisfaction. Have you heard that taught in the church? Not often. Praise complements what's already in you. That's why in the Old Covenant, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. In other words, it's already in there. When I come to this gathering, I'm full of it already. Full of joy, full of praise, full of thanksgiving to God. So all I'm doing, this is just an overflow. <laughs> so... Praise is not the experience, it's the gratitude of the experience. And so if God will make you to be full of joy in Him, we, He also must command all men to praise Him. If God wants you to be full of joy, then He has to command all men to praise Him. Why? So your joy can be full. And God is the one being in the universe that is not arrogant in demanding praise for himself. If you demand it, you're arrogant. If I demand it, I'm arrogant. If I want recognition, that's pride. But for God to demand that you praise him, that's not pride. He's the only being in this universe that can do that. Demand praise for himself. Why? Because his motive is for your happiness. That's the difference. His motive is for your happiness. <laughs> That's why praise is not about God, it's about you. Worship is not about God, it's about you. Because God wants your utmost happiness and joy in Him. That's hard, isn't it? Because we're not used to hearing that. God is not arrogant in demanding praise. Why? Because His motive is for your joy. So worship of God is actually for your benefit. Hmm? Don't stone me. This is biblical, whether you know it or not. Worship of God is actually for your benefit, not his. God does not need nothing from you, including your worship. I'm not hearing any amens. So there might be a struggle going on here with this. He does not need intimacy from you. You need intimacy from him. <laughs> huh? Worship is not for God, but it is about God. And there's a difference. Worship is about what God has done, not what I can do for God. When we come into a gathering... And we think we're doing something for God by lifting our hands and singing. We're not. That's pride. <laughs> we can't do anything for God. Worship is about our personal and corporate sanctification. Our corporate holiness. It's when I come here with my heart passionately after Him. And I bring that together into a corporate setting. 
So Jesus devastated the worship of the people of Israel, or most of them, when he said, These people worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. That's some frightening scripture. Have you ever thought about it? These people worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain they worship me, he said. In other words, they're wasting their time. Go to McDonald's, have a hamburger, go to the beach. You're wasting your time if your heart is not in it. What did Jesus mean? After all, Israel is upholding the very command that God had given and Jesus gave. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart and worship only Him. Aren't they worshipping Him? They were. They were going to the temple. They were worshipping Him. They were. Maybe they'd raise their hands. I don't know. Maybe they would. Maybe they would kneel. Maybe they'd be solemn. Maybe they'd be joyful. I don't know. It doesn't matter. They were going through the motions of what we call church. They were doing the stuff. They were obeying what His Word commanded. They were. They were obeying the Word. The Word told them to do it. They did it. You shall worship the Lord your God. Praise me, all you people. Yeah, so they're obeying Him. Right? Obedience is better than sacrifice. But Jesus just lifts the bar way beyond where they're at. He who looks upon a woman with lust has committed adultery. You know the law says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say to you, he who looks upon a woman. So he's lifting the bar. He's lifting the bar and worship here also. What's he doing? He's elevating the commandment to a heart issue, not a law issue. Worship is a duty. That's yeah, a duty. It is the duty of every human being. Not just every Christian, every human being. Every tree, every rock, every fish, every animal has a duty to worship God. That's what Jesus said. Even the rocks cry, will cry out to me. So th there is a duty in all of creation that every human being should worship God. The problem is we've got what worshippers all mixed up. Huh? All other goals should serve that goal to worship God. And there is a duty in it. So, in what sense is worship a duty? To clarify this, it's not a duty in the sense of, uh, Maggie, you're telling your children, uh, you must clean your room. That's a duty, right? So, it's not a duty in that sense. Or, um, look, obey your parents, because the Bible said. Children obey your parents and the Lord, it's the law, you must do it. That's not where God's coming from in that in this. It's not a duty in the sense of the pastor telling his congregation, uh, come here next week at ten o'clock and we're all going to sing songs and praise God and worship and bow before him, because that's what you should do. It's not a duty in that sense. So it's not a duty in the sense of bring your tithes and offerings to church on Sunday because you're robbing God if you don't, brother. It's not a duty in that sense. That's the very reason Jesus said, these people worship me with their words, but not their hearts. We can do all this stuff. They obeyed the word of God. Think about this. They obeyed it, but they did not delight in it. And there is a vast difference. And that's where Jesus was lifting this to. He's lifting the bar from obedience to delight. Now you can see why joy is so important. It's not just a question of, I need to obey God's word. I need, look, do what you're told. It's not just about that. It's, I'm happy to do what I'm told. <laughs> I want to do what I'm told. There's a, there's a massive difference with, with doing something out of obedience because... You're instructed to do it and doing it doing it because you desire to do it. You want to do it. You can obey God and not be worshipping. Yeah. Yeah. So even obeying the word of God is not sufficient. When Jesus came, he lifts the bar on obedience. He lifts the bar on the law. Their hearts are in conflict with their words. 
And reluctant obedience always leads to disobedience or leads to rebellion. So it's a duty, it's our mission in life to become inwardly changed. Each one of us have that duty. Every, every human being has, whether they accept it or not. We have a duty to change inwardly, to become a new person. It's my duty or my mission to delight myself in the Lord. Or to find my happiness in Him. That's my duty. I need to find that, Mike. I need to find my happiness in Him because I can't find it in anything else. I don't know about you. It doesn't matter what you get or what you've got or what you've had. It's not enough. With all my heart do I seek thee, the psalmist said. Not with all my words. I thought of that psalm as the deer pants for the water. And, and just the picture of that, the desperation of that animal looking for water. Desperation because of desire. Desire. Desire has to fuel desperation. I know I'm going over things that some of them I said before, but they're so important to our walk with the Lord. It, so it's necessary at this point to look at this. What is the definition of joy? What is the definition of biblical joy? And um, the purpose of knowing a definition of joy, the way the apostle uses it, especially in the book of Philippians, so we don't use our own understanding of joy because that's the problem. We're getting clouded with our own understanding of joy to biblical joy. And uh, so we're talking about Christian joy as Paul uses it. So here's a definition, best I can come up with. Christian joy is a good feeling. It is. So God has feelings, yes. God created us with feelings. Christian joy is a good feeling in the soul. The soul is the inner seat of your emotions, your mind, etc., as we see, see, see with the eyes of our heart the beauty of Christ in his word and in his work. Christian joy is a good feeling in the soul as we see with the eyes of our heart, not the eyes of your head, the beauty of Christ in his word and in his work. That's deep. But you're not babies in Christ. So you mean God's interest in our feelings? Uh, and what they're rooted in? God is very interested in our feelings and what they're rooted in. Did you mean God is interested in the stability of my joy? And my happiness? And, and it being stable all the time? Not some of the time, all of the time. Or does it depend on circumstances? See, joy, general joy, joy of the world, depends on circumstances. It's up and down, like... Oh, I won't say what I was going to say. I think some of you know. <laughs> it was a bad thought. Come from the enemy, Alan! <laughs> <laughs> Christian joy doesn't go up and down. It's not dependent on circumstances. That's why we have to fight for this. You have to fight for this joy. It's a gift. Joy is a gift. Galatians 5.22. But we have to fight for it. Because, you know what you're going through at the moment, sister. How difficult it is to fight. To maintain this joy in the midst of unbearable crisis. God's wanting us. To have this joy all of the time, not some of the time. And God's interest in our joy all of the time, so our circumstances do not overcome us. That's why. <laughs> you see it? Because we haven't got joy, the circumstances will overcome us. We haven't got this joy in the Lord. So let's break this down. Christian joy is an emotion or a feeling that comes from truth being revealed or seen. Christian joy is an emotion, it's a feeling that comes from truth. It's like the light goes on. I see it. I get it. You ever read your Bible 
and you've read that same passage of scripture over and over and over again, then one day you read it and you go, huh, I've never seen that before. I get it. That's revelation. That's the light going. That's, that's the eyes of your heart seeing. That's revelation coming to you. So Christian joy is an emotion or a feeling that comes from truth being seen. It's like the eyes of my heart go, huh, woo, I got it. And you lock into that. Once you've got it, once you've got revelation, it never leaves. Unlike knowledge, knowledge can leave your mind. Revelation can never leave you. Even if you lost your mind, you still have revelation. That's amazing, isn't it? So that's why this joy is not of the mind. <laughs> yeah? So Christian joy is this emotional feeling that comes from truth being revealed or seen. Once truth is seen, once you got that revelation, it becomes an anchor for joy. It anchors your joy. Because it's like, whoa, I got it, finally I see something there. And, you know, that's why studying the Word of God is so important. Study to show yourself approved. Because we have to anchor ourselves in all of the Scripture. The less understanding of God's word we've got, the less joy we can have. That's the truth. Hard truth. So joy is not something that comes as you want it to. And uh, in other words, you cannot snap your finger and go, presto, hey, I've got joy now. No. Biblical joy is not something that comes from an emotion. In other words, it cannot come from creating an atmosphere. I heard uh, an American evangelist that you'd all know, and I won't mention his name, big timer, that always focused. He said, the way, the way that God heals the people is I create an atmosphere. Well, biblical joy doesn't come from creating an atmosphere. To facilitate that emotion. No, it doesn't. That's only human emotion. I guarantee that that if you're a talented musician, capable musician, you can create atmosphere. That will touch people's emotions. Men can manipulate emotions through drugs, we know that. Alcohol, music through creating an atmosphere, even through words. Hmm? So biblical joy is the work of the Holy Spirit, yet the Bible commands us with seeming impossible statements like, rejoice in the Lord always. <laughs> sometimes. Always. Sometimes. Always. Sometimes. Always. Rejoice in the Lord always. There's no lead up here. He's not giving us a break, is he? <laughs> but you don't understand. What I'm going through. Rejoice in the Lord always. Do you get it? There's no let out there. Or another impossible, seeming impossible thing. Count it all joy <laughs> when you fall into various trials and temptations. Knowing that the trying of your faith worketh patience. What do you mean? You don't understand the temptation I'm going through or the trial. Count it all joy. See, these are not like, oh, I'll try and do my best. Paul's just making a statement. Hey, when you're going through that, just, just remember the joy in the Lord that you've got. One of the early church fathers, Augustine, he said this, Father, command what you will and grant what you command. I think it's a good statement. Command what you will, God. Whatever you want to command, command it. But grant what you command. In other words, if you apply this to joy, you've commanded us to be joyful. So give us the joy as well. That's what Augustine came up with on this. So um, he knew that there are emotions towards God that we cannot just make happen. You can't just whip up joy. All right, oh, I'll just whip up a bit of joy. You can't do that. It's not possible. So he's saying, if you command us, Lord, to be joyful, give us also what you're commanding. My joy towards God is coming from the Holy Spirit and through my soul as my soul is renewed. Not my body. Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is joy. Philippians 4.4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. 
So how do you rejoice in the Lord if you don't know anything about the Lord? It's hard, isn't it? So the less you know about the Lord, or know Him, I should say, not just knowledge, but intimately know Him, the less you intimately know Him, the more difficult it is going to be to rejoice in trials and suffering. It gives you perspective of this man, Paul. When he said, oh, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. It gives you insight into how much he really knew him. Mm. That he can sit in the stinking prison, waiting on death row, and talk about, rejoice in the Lord always. <laughs> it gives you insight into this man's knowing of Christ. He knew him intimately. So you must know him to be able to rejoice in him and we can only rejoice to the degree we know him because the holy spirit will not just flick on the switch of joy he won't do that there has to be engagement from our minds there has to be where we see with the eyes of our heart the beauty of the lord what do i mean by that well study to show yourself a proof study means you have to engage with your mind Right? And as you engage with your mind, the study of the Word of God, revelation will come. Mm. And you anchor your joy in that. Every time you get fresh revelation, whatever, anchor your joy in it. That you have hope because of that revelation. The more revelation, the more joy. The more solid you become anchored. Huh? So that's exactly what John meant when he when he said, we beheld, we saw his glory. We saw it. It's like the light went on. Revelation, all of a sudden. Why? Because they had such an understanding of the scripture. And now they saw the manifest presence of God incarnate, Jesus Christ himself, standing there in their presence. So they see what is in their mind already, what they've been reading, what they understand. They see it. We see it. The light goes on. Revelation. We've seen the glory. It's him. We need to underline this great truth. Christian joy does not die in sorrow. It does not die in sorrow. It still can be seen. Even I am sorrowful. You can still see Christ in my sorrow. Our joy does not leave when sorrow abounds. It doesn't go. See, whereas natural joy does. But this joy doesn't. It remains steadfast. Joy and sorrow in the Christian life are not sequential or they're not in any logical order. They're simultaneous. In other words, they're done at the same time. You can have joy and sorrow at the same time. You can be absolutely sorrowful and yet still have the joy of the Lord. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10. I like this New Living Translation version. It says, Our hearts ache, but we always have joy. Well, the English Standard Version says, Sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. There's no separation. Mm. <laughs> We're poor, he goes on and he says, yet we give spiritual riches to others. We own nothing, but we have everything. <laughs> Did you see it? Sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Written from a dingy, room in a prison cell. The Apostle Paul is in a place we would typically associate, associate with misery and trials, chained. Unlike our prisons, which also must be miserable. I wouldn't like to be there, even in New Zealand prisons. But in comparison, nothing compared to what Paul's going through here. Chained to a Roman soldier in a damp prison cell. <laughs> Paul says rejoice. 
It's hard to comprehend with your mind. Paul surrounded with every conceivable obstacle to joy. So where does he draw this happiness from? Where does he draw this joy from under such adverse circumstances? And Paul's joy is not anchored in his circumstances, but rather in his Saviour. Because his Redeemer lives, that's his hope. He'll make all things new. That's his hope. Not his circumstances. But what's out here ahead of him? For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, the Bible says. So he doesn't anchor his life in the now, in the sorrow, in the pain, in the hardship. He's anchoring in and out here for the joy that's set before him so that he can hook into that joy, anchor into that rather than into the problem now, the pain now. And we've all got it. The brother Bruce said this morning, the pain of losing someone that you love so much. Horrific pain can send people over the edge. Terrible pain. Being incarcerated, especially when you've done, haven't done the crime. Dreadful pain to live, torment to live with. But if we anchor in that, it's going to take us down. We have to anchor in what's out here for the joy that's before us. And that's what Paul is getting at here. Paul's not anchored in his circumstance, but he is anchored in the Saviour. And in 1 Peter 1, he says this, verse 3 to 9. I'm going to read. It's quite long, but please hear it. Blessed be the God, our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection. Born again to a living hope. There's a hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven just for you, whom by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. I love this next verse, verse 6. In this, in what? What I just read. The hope of your salvation. In this you rejoice. In what? In those first three verses. Anchor your hope in those first three verses. An imperishable, undefiled, unfading hope that's kept for you in heaven. Rejoice because of your salvation. Then without even a change to the theme, notice how Paul addresses this. He continues by qualifying that your joy will be tested. Mm -hmm. So he starts off saying, hey, you have every reason to be joyful. <laughs> Look at this, first three verses. Just anchor your hope in here. And then he gives you the big hammer. And he said, but expect you're going to be tried and tested. Why? To establish if your faith is genuine. That's what he says. That's his words. To establish whether your faith is genuine. Oops. We've had a few people in the last few years that say they have faith. But when the trials come, they complain and they grumble like the Israelites. And they want to go back to Egypt. <laughs> your joy will be tested by trials to establish if your faith is genuine. And if you will rejoice in those trials. Wow. So think twice before you can play it next time. <laughs> yeah. Verse 6. Though for now and a little while, even if necessary, you have been grieved by your various trials. Verse 7. So that the genuineness of your faith is tested. Wow. It's quite an easy measure, Mike, when someone opens their mouth to see where their face is. Generous of your faith is tested more precious than gold and perishes. Though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. <laughs> I love this. Probably because I've pondered on it all week. You want to do the same. Though you have not seen him, you love him. What's he saying? You haven't seen Jesus, but you love him. Though you do not see him, you believe in him. You haven't seen Jesus, you believe in him. And rejoice with joy, 
that is inexpressible. Look at that word, big word, inexpressible, and filled with glory. Mm -hmm. Wow. We want the glory to cover the whole earth. How's it going to do it? In you. <laughs> In you. God's not going to go, whoom, bow, there's my glory. No, he's going to go, there's my brother, there's my sister, carrying my glory as a vessel for me. How? In the joy. Going through the trials and the tests. inexpressible and filled with glory. Verse 9, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. In this you rejoice. Though you are grieved, can you see the simultaneous of this, how these two go hand in hand? Though you are grieved, rejoice. They're done at the same time. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10, sorrowful, yet always Rejoicing. Man, if we had a text in the house, if I, if I could have one text, that would have to be the most important one. Sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Why? Rejoicing in the hope that you've got for us. Where is that? Second Corinthians 6, verse 10, Mike. Sorrowful. That's the next verse. Sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. So this is the Christian war. And anyone who tells you different is lying to you. Rejoicing because I have hope in my salvation. Sorrowful because in this world I will have sorrows. Be of good cheer. Jesus said it. For I have overcome. In this world you will have sorrows. I will have sorrows. Mm -hmm. Paul's focus was not on himself, but rather pursued the spiritual maturing of others. How? Joy. That was the first scripture we read this morning. By being a partner, partnering with them to make sure that you bring that person through to the utmost happiness in the Lord. Joy in the Lord. So what the world needs to see from you, from me, is the joy that comes from knowing the Lord even in great adversity. This is the mandate of the church, to be a light. Jesus said, don't, you don't put the light under a bushel. That's what he's talking about here. How, what is the light? The light is Christ. Well, joy is comes from God. It doesn't come from man. It's a fruit of the Spirit. People need to see that. That's the problem we've had in the church. People are not seeing God. They're seeing man, they're seeing performance, they're seeing ability. But they're not seeing God. They're not seeing the reality of God. And what we do, and it, it, I almost want to vomit with this, that in a church setting we have this upbeat atmosphere people walk into. Smoke machines going, disco balls, lights, whatever. Everything's going. Great musicians, professional, whatever. People walk in and, and, and they're down and they're emotionally trodden and they're sorrowful and we try and bring those people out of that in a false way. Mm. It doesn't work. It does not work. You may touch their emotions for a few minutes and then they're going to crash just as hard. Why not allow people to be sorrowful? Why not allow people to express their pain? Why not allow it? Why have we painted this picture, especially in the modern day charismatic church, that everyone has to be upbeat? That's not how it is. Paul's trying to get this point across. What the world needs to see is your sorrow, but how you handle that sorrow, that your joy, your hope, your anchor is in the Lord, and that's what's going to bring you through this. This is the mandate of the church. This is the light of the church. And we're shutting it down. Isaiah 53. He was a man of sorrows. And acquainted with grief. That's Jesus. Hebrews 12. Yet for the joy. I just tied those two together because I love the two verses. He, Jesus, is a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. But for the joy that was set before him, he endured that. That's great. I don't know about you, that really does it for me. <laughs> Jesus knew sorrow, he knew pain. He he chose he chose to. 
He chose, he chose sorrow, he chose pain, mate. He chose it. It's his choice, he didn't have to. Mate, he chose it so he could relate to me, so he can relate to you. Uh, so why do we try and deny sorrow, pain, loss? And use God's word as a tablet to numb it. I read a book once, some of you probably read it, I won't name the author because you'd know him, called God's Medicine. And it's about, um, in short, it promotes the use of scripture to so-called remove sorrow, to remove pain, to remove loss. Quote these scriptures and this will go away. That's your tablet. Well, it's, we laugh, but actually, this whole movement's teaching that stuff. God never asked us to do that. Pain is real, sorrow is real, loss is real, and deserves the compassionate respect that Jesus gave it. Huh? And much of the church today is determined to upbeat everything, to create this atmosphere where human emotions are engaged and promises of hope that will take away your sorrow. Well, emotions won't do that. It might for a few minutes. It's like a few drinks might help too. <laughs> or a toke on a joint or whatever. That might help too. <laughs> for a few minutes. But it's not going to give us lasting joy. Lasting mm. happiness. Mm. So people don't need this disrespectful playfulness that is being offered and packaged so close to what the world offers. Huh? No, what people need is the Word of God taught at a level that's so deep, rock solid, that that rock is so deep, that foundation is so deep, nothing will move their joy in times of sorrow. That's what's needed. So, uh, why does the world need to see our joy in times of suffering? Why do they need to see that? The answer to that is because God so loved the world, he didn't want any person to end their life on this earth without knowing him at a level of him being their greatest treasure. And hopefully their only treasure. Why, why do people want what I've got if what I've got is no different? than what the world offers. Why? I've observed, I've been around long enough, and some of you have, to observe the church movements here in, in this region, across this nation. And it's almost a pattern, cyclic, cyclic pattern, that today this church is flavour of the month because they've got the best music, they've got the best building, they've got the best smoke, whatever, smoke machine or and tomorrow, there's going to be someone who does it just a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And so these people here go over here, thinking they're going to find something they didn't find here. Because the buzz now has worn off. The excitement of that, whatever's being offered here, has worn off. The happiness that's found, or joy that's found, and anything this world offers is not what the Christian life should be displaying. That just kills the faith movement right there. That comment. Happiness or joy that's found in anything that the world offers. Paul smashes this deception. Anything the world can offer you is not what we should be displaying or talking about. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3 to 10. Verse 3. I love it. We put obstacles, Paul speaking to the church of Corinth, in nobody's way. My goodness, every church should have that at the front of the church. We put obstacles in nobody's way. <laughs> have you heard that scripture before, mate? It's awesome. I will not put an obstacle in your way. That's what Paul's saying. Paul cares that he does not drive people away. 
He cares about people. He cares about this church at Corinth so much. Verse 3. So that no fault may be found with my ministry. Verse 4. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance in affliction and in hardship, in calamities. I'll read the rest of this and I'll come back. Just explain a little bit. Beatings, imprisonment, riot. This is Paul's life, by the way. Labor, sleepless nights, hunger, purity, patience, knowledge, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. Though honor, sorry, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors, yet we're true. As unknown, yet we are well known. As dying, yet we live. As punished and not killed. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Mm. He just prattles off a whole lot of trials, tests, problems, hurts, pains, whatever he's going through. And he said, as sorrowful, yet I'm always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. As having nothing, yet possessing everything. Paul is saying, what I'm about to do is remove obstacles from you right now. That's what he's saying to the church. Obstacles to your faith. We all know there's obstacles in the church to your faith, to my faith. That's what Paul's saying. I'm going to remove them. I'm going to take them out of the way. Obstacles to your believing. Obstacles to you seeing the truth. And then I'm going to commend or recommend myself to you. In other words, follow me as I follow Christ. The so first step is, I'm going to remove every obstacle, and that should be the job of every church leader, every pastor, be it a house church or a larger church, doesn't matter. Every orphanage, every evangelistic crusade, to remove obstacles from the hearers. And that's what Paul is saying here. And watch how he does it. Watch how he does it. This is staggering. Watch now how Paul does this. How he removes obstacles from the world so the people will be drawn to Christ because that's the objective, obviously, right? Um, we want people to follow Christ through our lives. So Paul wants to remove the obstacles so people will do that. That's what he's saying. He's not out to make enemies. He's not out to try and lord it over people, as we've established. He wants people to be safe. He wants churches to grow. He wants people to be free. So watch it because it flies in the face of human church growth experts, what he does here. He does it in three ways. Firstly, by describing his sufferings. That's how he does it. Secondly, by describing his character and his faith. And thirdly, by describing the typical paradoxes of Christian life. So let's quickly unpack this and I'm going to stop. The question you've got to ask yourself is, how is Paul commending his faith in these things? So how is he saying, follow me in these things. That's what he's saying. Through his sufferings, which is verse 3 to verse 5, through his character, verse 6 to verse 7, through the paradoxes of verse 8 to 10. Sorrowful yet always rejoicing. This is huge. This is a big one. Not just rejoicing in pain or temptation or sadness, but sorrowful, but always rejoicing. Rejoicing in sorrow. So when sorrow comes upon you, rejoice. Praise the Lord. How do you do it, Paul? <laughs> when you don't feel like doing it. How have you removed this obstacle, Paul, from the people? <laughs> That's going to hinder them coming to Christ by doing that. How have you done it? He's removed obstacles by removing any doubt that he isn't in it for the money. That's the first one. I'm not in this for the money. Look at what I've gone through in my life. Look at the trials, the tests, the pain, the sufferings, the hardships. I'm not in this for money. Goodbye, faith message. Mm. Number two, he's removed obstacles by removing any doubt that suffering is definitely a part of the Christian walk. Definitely. And there's no way of avoiding it. And God will use suffering. Number three, he's removed obstacles by proving he is not a Christian to receive any benefits from it. It doesn't look like he's getting many benefits, Mike. <laughs> There's no benefits this world is going to offer Paul. That's real clear when you read that list of things he's go through. None. And this is scary. This is real scary. Why? Because so many pastors are teaching the opposite and living the opposite. There's benefits if you come to Christ. <laughs> 
Health, wealth, prosperity. Yeah. Paul's removing that obstacle right here. This is reality. This is the Christian walk. He said, this is how it is. And we need to anchor ourselves in that. He's removing the garbage teaching, the nonsensical teaching that all of us have had. Come on, let's be honest. And he's anchoring truth right here. This is the Christian walk. There's going to be sorrow. There's going to be pain. There's going to be trials. You're going to go through hardships, poverty, lack, suffer. That's how he's removing the obstacles, by bringing reality. Because if the problem is this. If the people are coming to Christ, because if you give 10%, you're doing good. But if you give 20%, brother, you can get a little bit more from the man. Or if, or if you quote the scripture 10 times, you'll be healed, brother. I went to one of those Bible seminaries, so I have some knowledge in this. But the problem is, if people are coming to Christ for that stuff, that stuff, they're not coming to Jesus to die to self. They're coming because of the promise of your best life now, which is a false book. And that gospel does not lead to the road of Calvary. And if any man desire to follow me, let him take up his cross. Deny himself and follow me. For whoever will save his life will lose it. There's a paradox. Whoever will lose his life will save it. There's a paradox. You want to have all that stuff? Fill your boots. God will even give it to you. There we go. I can give you scripture for that. God will even give it. You can claim those scriptures all you want. And God will give it. He'll hand you over your heart's desire and entrap you in the very sin that you're desiring after oh yes the upbeat guitars the drums they can attract the crowd especially if they're played by cable musicians they can give you a feel good emotion maybe give some temporary peace while you're there for your temp tormented soul it worked for soul temporarily the promise of health and wealth and whatever you desire will attract a crowd. Big crowds, we know that. May even give what is promised to some. But it's the opposite of what Paul says here. And I tend to trust this man. Because he said, follow me as I follow Christ. Mm -hmm. We commend our ministry by telling you the truth. We strip away we strip away that grey area that all of us have struggled with. Is this true? Is this not true? Paul just rips the curtain right back here. We commend our ministry, our life, by our afflictions, our calamities, our sleepless nights, our hardships, our lack. Hey, this is the Christian walk. However, in that, joy can be found. <laughs> Father, I thank you for these profound words, words of the Apostle Paul. Mm -hmm. Oh Lord, that we could have the insight, the, the understanding, the, 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 the relationship that he had with you. Yes. I stand with his words. I, I, I parrot his words. All oh, that I might know you. And I know that's everyone here. That's our prayer. That we might know you. Yes. Like him. Even, even if you take us as far as you took him, Lord. That we would know you like he knew you. That no matter what is thrown in our lives. That we are full of joy. Why? Because of our hope that's anchored in you. Forgive us, Lord, where we've looked at the trials and fallen into that ditch. Thank you for these wonderful words, Lord, that the Apostle Paul commended himself to the people about. Thank you for truth. 
Thank you for your love. Thank you for the hope. Lord, we pray for those that could not attend this day. May you bless them, Lord. Strengthen them wherever they are. May your face shine upon them. May your face shine upon everyone here, Lord. And help us to enter into the fullness of that joy of the Lord. Amen, amen.